Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for virtual Bulldogs Behind the Scenes featuring an exclusive look of the Olga Lakala Herbarium that is located at UMD. Well, my name is Molly Clevin and I'm from the University of Minnesota Duluth Alumni Relations team. Today we are going to take a behind the scenes look at the Olga Lakala Herbarium at UMD and learn about how this unique resource provides learning and research opportunities for students, faculty, and the community. I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Amanda Gruss. Dr. Gruss is an assistant professor in biology and the director of the Olga Lakala Herbarium. She is also a current research associate in the Department of Botany at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC. Gruss earned her PhD in biology with a focus in genetics from Duke University in 2014. She was awarded a postdoctoral fellowship in the Department of Botany at the National Museum of Natural History from 2014 to 2016, when she joined the Department of Biology at UMD in 2016. Dr. Gruss is a passionate educator and a dedicated evolutionary biologist and natural historian with taxonomic expertise in ferns and their relatives. I will now hand it over to Dr. Gruss. Uh, thank you, Molly, for that kind introduction. Um, thanks, everyone else, for joining us. I'm so happy to have you here. Um, my name, again, is Dr. Amanda Grews, and like Molly said, I'm an assistant professor of biology and director of the Olga Lakala Herbarium at the University of Minnesota Duluth. Today, I would like to take you on a short journey to learn about our shared legacy, UMD's collection of more than 55,000 preserved plant specimens. So, you may be wondering, what exactly is a herbarium? A herbarium is a museum repository of preserved plant specimens. Paraphrasing from an article published in the Plant Science Bulletin, herbaria are remarkable and irreplaceable sources of information about plants and the world they inhabit. Herbaria provide the comparative material that is essential for studies in taxonomy, systematics, ecology, even anatomy and morphology, or conservation biology and biodiversity studies, also including ethnobotany and paleobiology. They are also used for teaching and outreach. Herbaria are a veritable gold mine of information. There are more than 60 million specimens in 620 herbaria across the United States, and 7 million specimens in 110 herbaria in Canada. Nearly 5 million specimens alone are held at the U.S. National Herbarium, housed in, at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. Herbarium specimens, also called voucher specimens, are wild or field-collected plants that are pressed, dried, and mounted on archival, acid-free paper for long-term storage and preservation. When properly maintained, Herbarium specimens can retain their form and color indefinitely, making them an invaluable resource for botanical studies across time. On top of that, researchers worldwide can request voucher specimens from museum collections on loan, leveraging an international network of herbaria, just like an interlibrary loan, but for natural history collections. Here at UMD, the Olga Lakala Herbarium serves as a critical repository for botanical research, education, and outreach on the North Shore of Lake Superior and beyond. The herbarium collection was first established by Finnish immigrant Olga Lakala in 1935. And you can see um, Olga Lakala pictured here in the herbarium on the left. At that time, she was professor of botany and curator of the herbarium at the Duluth State Teachers College which later became the University of Minnesota Duluth. Lakala collected the vast majority of plant specimens that are deposited in the UMD collection. Here, you can see Lakala's handwritten signature on a voucher specimen of Saracenia purpurea, a carnivorous pitcher plant that she collected on June 18, 1939. On the label, she notes, open border of small lake in Sphagnum, 18 miles north of Duluth on Highway 53, St. Louis County, Minnesota. This specimen, Lakala's number 2983, was collected while she was curator of the herbarium at the Duluth State Teachers College. Before joining the faculty at what is now UMD, Lakala earned her PhD in botany from the University of Minnesota. Throughout her career, Lakala's systematic investigations of plant diversity were published widely, 
in books and in peer reviewed research journals, such as the American Journal of Botany. After retiring in 1958, Lackala continued to actively pursue botanical studies until her passing in 1980. Today, Lackala's specimens comprise the majority of the UMD collection, and her duplicate specimens are deposited in major herbaria across North America and abroad, including the Gray Herbarium at Harvard University and the British National Museum of Natural History in London. Today, the Olga Lackala Herbarium is housed on campus at UMD, around the corner from the planetarium in Marshall W. Allworth Hall. With more than 50,000 specimens, our herbarium is the second largest in Minnesota and is notable for its holdings of plant species from the boreal forest of North America, collected near the southern edge of their geographic range. The oldest specimen in the collection dates from 1846, although most vouchers have been deposited since 1940. Notably, we, we maintain critical collections for the State Department of Natural Resources, including a vast array of aquatic specimens, and vouchers from statewide inventories, including Voyagers National Park, the BWCA, and Grand Portage National Monument. The journey from field to filing cabinet begins when researchers collect wild plants in nature. Sometimes plant specimens are collected as part of a regional or ecological inventory. Other times, botanists target particular species for taxonomic or biodiversity studies. First, the collector takes note of the precise locality using GPS to determine latitude, longitude, aspect, and elevation in their collection notebook. Then, the plant is collected and given a unique identifier, the collection number, that is used for tracking across institutions through time. Plants are then placed in a folded sheet of newspaper with pressure being applied while the plant is allowed to dry, ultimately resulting in a flattened specimen. For example, in 2019, students in my lab, and this includes a master's student in the Integrated Biosciences graduate program and an undergraduate researcher in the BURST summer research program, accompanied me on a field expedition to Algonquin Provincial Park in Ontario. We obtained permits to collect specimens of a rare species known from the park, that is also found in Northern Minnesota on ancient geological formations that span our border with Canada. This 10 day expedition took us over 3,200 miles with more than 10 kilometers of portages. Specimens that were collected on this trip are now deposited in the Olga Lackala Herbarium, serving as valuable resources for genetic studies of this rare cliff dwelling fern. After returning from the field, the first stop for newly collected vouchers is the specimen preparation room across the hall from the UMD herbarium. The specimen prep room is where staff, students, and volunteers accession new specimens into the Olga Lackala herbarium collection. This is where we transcribe label data into digital specimen records. This is where we mount dried plant collections onto archival paper. And this is where we prepare specimen labels for long-term preservation. So here in this cabinet, you can see just some of the specimens that are currently being accessioned into the Olgalakala collection. So here, you can see me working. Um, I'm working with a student volunteer who <laughs> she uses this time to relax while she's studying for the MCATs. Um, but together with the student, uh, you can see that we are handling the fragile specimens really carefully, um, applying glue and we also use other techniques to affix the plant to archival paper. We then weigh the plant down with heavy washers until the glue is dried. And here in this clip, Lila is using a swipe technique to apply minimal glue to the plant specimen. So you can see there, she's got a little piece of cardstock and she's using um, just Elmer's glue, which is perfectly appropriate for this technique. Um, and again, the, the dried plants are really fragile. So she'll use a forceps here to um, carefully lift the leaf and just apply a minimal amount of glue there to the backside. And 
while we do affix um, a good bit of the specimen down, we don't glue the whole thing um, to allow a little bit of, of room for um, people to look at morphological characters for research purposes. And once the plant is affixed to paper, we also add these little um, fragment packets to the, to the sheet. And these are um, just a little spot that if anything breaks off of the specimen, you can place that plant material in the fragment packet. And of course, we then have to apply our um, stamps, including the Olga Lackeller herbarium stamp up here in the corner. And this is all just before the plant is given its very own unique accession number for the collection. Students and community members can learn how to mount archival specimens at our plant mounting workshops, like this one held last fall in the Bagley class classroom on campus at, at UMD, organized in conjunction with the Arrowhead Native Plant Explorers Group based here in Duluth. In this photo, you can see Gretchen Meyer instructing on how to prepare plant specimens. At this workshop, participants were supplied with plants that were collected as part of the Flora of Glensheen project. And in addition to local workshops, we also welcome volunteers into the herbarium to mount specimens or to assist with specimen imaging and digitization. And of course, preparing plant specimens is not just a valuable exercise for research, it can also be an artistic endeavor. For example, Emeritus Professor of Biology at UMD, Dr. John Pastor, leverages his background in natural history illustration to prepare exquisite voucher specimens. Shown here are just a few highlights from Pastor's mounted vouchers. These specimens were collected by my predecessor in the herbarium, Dr. David Schimpf. You can really see that bright color which will be retained um, through time. And then over here on the right hand side, there are some aquatic specimens that are mounted in archival bags. And, and here are some lovely specimens that were mounted by one of our most excellent volunteers, Cindy French. And once the specimens are mounted um, and accessioned into the collection, the next step is to take high resolution digital images of each one using this light box and camera setup. These images are associated with digitized labeled data via a digital barcode. All specimen images and their digital data are then uploaded to the Minnesota Biodiversity Atlas online where anyone can search for, download, and utilize these resources. Today, the Olga Lackala Herbarium is a fundamental resource for biodiversity and research, biodiversity research and education at UMND. Currently, a variety of taxonomic studies are underway, many of which leverage specimens that are borrowed on loan from worldwide institutions and maintained temporarily and with care in the UMD Herbarium. For example, Students in my lab are gathering morphological and molecular data from herbarium specimens to characterize a rare, previously undocumented species from the Cerro de la Muerte along the Cordillera Central in the cloud forests of central Costa Rica. And pictured here in the middle is a specimen that's on loan from the Missouri Botanical Garden. Um, and that specimen was collected. You can see the map of Costa Rica there um, and you know, approximately where that red dot is located. And this specimen is a putative hybrid between the two species um, that are shown uh, live uh, images, or excuse me, live plant images uh, shown on the left-hand upper corner and on the right. The Olga Lackala Herbarium also supports active research across UMD, providing voucher specimens either from our collection or from other museums worldwide, and also serving as a repository for voucher material for research projects. For example, Dr. Brianna Gross conducted a study on uh, Vaccinium vitis idea, so that's the lingonberry that's pictured there, um, looking at genetic diversity of this North Shore species. Uh, researchers from the Large Lakes Observatory, including Dr. Katherine Schreiner and Dr. Byron Steinman, have deposited specimens from their research um, on geochemistry along the North Shore. Uh, Dr. Julie Ederson's project baseline, some of which uh, some of you may have heard of this project, it's a, a 
national endeavor to uh, preserve genetic diversity through seed preservation. And her voucher specimens are currently at being accessioned into the UMD herbarium. And lastly, I'll just highlight a new faculty member at our college, Dr. Lucas Busta in chemistry, who uh, he studies the evolution of uh, phytochemicals, so plant chemicals, and he's been leveraging specimens from the UMD herbarium to explore um, uh, uh, his techniques for looking at these um, long-term and stable chemicals. Altogether, these research studies directly integrate undergraduate and graduate both research and research dissemination. Here, students from my lab are shown at the Botanical Society of America annual meeting held in Rochester, Minnesota, where we presented papers and oral presentations on our research related to the herbarium. Here on the left is a graph that's from um, one of those student presentations, which was given a national award um, for undergraduate research. In this study, Blake Foskey examined the suitability of research of um, herbarium specimens for DNA sequencing. And so the histogram shows you uh, the number of specimens for which he attempted DNA sequencing. And in pink, you can see the number of specimens which um, successfully amplified uh, genetic regions. And you can see that even specimens over 100 years old um, successfully uh, gave us really good um, genetic data. And honestly, these uh, techniques are only improving um, in time. And so I imagine that uh, the ability to leverage very old uh, museum specimens for genetic studies is only um, uh, just beginning to, to um, break worldwide. The Floor of Glensheen um, project highlighted here is just one example of expanding outreach and education related to the UMD herbarium. So in this study, um, <clears throat> Basically what we've done is we've taken uh, the Glensheen Mansion property and all of the non-planted flora, so not, not the plants that we go and, and see that are on display, but instead the ones that are growing in the cracks and um, along the shoreline. And these, um, over the past two years, we've had students taking both uh, photographic vouchers, which you can access on the iNaturalist website, um, as well as physical vouchers, which are being stored in the UMD collection. And altogether, this project aims to uh, better educate all of us on the contents of our flora in our very own backyard. And this research has been, uh, or outreach has been supported by a University of Minnesota Chancellor small grant. So I hope that you've enjoyed this short behind the scenes tour of the Ogallacula Herbarium here at UMD. We should all be proud of this incredible resource and the role it plays for expanding research, education, and outreach on the North Shore and beyond. If you are interested in contributing to the Olga Lackala Herbarium, consider volunteering. Um, currently, we're undergoing a massive effort to digitize the Clifford and Isabel Algren collection. Uh, Clifford, Clifford and Isabel Algren were contemporaries of Olga Lackala, and their personal museum collection, which was housed for a long time um, at the Clo Cloquet Forestry Center and is now uh, physically on campus at the Olga Lackala Herbarium at UMD, um, we're making a big effort to, to digitize all of those specimen images so that they can also be integrated into the Minnesota Biodiversity Atlas on online. If you're interested in volunteering as a part of this project, um, please just uh, follow up with us. There's some contact information at the end of this slide deck um, that you can use to get in touch and uh, join the effort. In addition to volunteering, um, there are also opportunities for donating to the Olga Lackala Herbarium Fund, which supports ongoing work in the Olga Lackala Herbarium. Um, any amount is uh, uh, very much appreciated. Um, and uh, if you're interested um, in being a bigger, bigger contributor, we're now targeting the Buy a Cabinet campaign to expand specimen storage one cabinet at a time. And for a $2,500 donation, you can uh, receive a permanent plaque associated with your herbarium cabinet. Um, if you're interested in making a gift of any size, uh, just follow this link included there at the bottom.
And with that, I'd really just like to thank you all for your attention, for taking the time to learn about this um, really cool resource and uh, you know, biodiversity repository here on campus at UMD. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the herbarium, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm happy to always answer questions and provide um, support for any members of our community. And with that, I'll take some questions. Um, well, thank you so much, um, Amanda, for taking us on the tour of the herbarium. And we are now going to take question and answers. Um, so I think to kick things off, um, a question came in during the presentation, wondering about um, when you collect a specimen, how do you know that you're not picking up like bugs or anything like that uh, when you're collecting? Oh, that's a great question. Um, the answer is you don't and you are. <laughs> so there are always little creepy crawlies and critters, whether they're fungi or bacteria or insects that come along with specimens. And so before um, in that transition kind of from field to filing cabinet, um, before the specimens are actually uh, brought into that prep room, they're put in a freezer um, and that freeze, they, we usually freeze them for about a week to ensure that any pests that might be um, tagging along are uh, uh, taken care of uh, before they're brought into the museum collection. And this is really important because uh, bugs love dried dead plants as much as live ones. So we have to really uh, mitigate against that issue in these collections big time. And another question um, related to um, the selling um, specimens. Do you ever sell specimens or um, lend them out to nurseries and that sort of thing? Um, are they available to the public? Um, we do not sell specimens. And part of it is, and I know it sounds um, silly to say so, but they are truly um, priceless, most specimens. So when you actually account for the person effort, the time, the travel, um, and the long-term maintenance of these collections, there's really no price point you could put on them. Um, some of them are the only known accession of a species in the world, um, living or otherwise. And so for that reason, we really stay away from um, any kind of commercial uh, uh, um, uh, associations. Um, that said, for research purposes, we are very much open to being utilized by the community. And so if, for example, you or someone you know is interested in leveraging her Herbarium material. You can reach out to the herbarium director locally. Um, I'm that person for UMD, and they're always happy to talk to you more about these kinds of things. <laughs> oh, I'm excited. We have a couple. Uh, uh, we have Dr. Kathleen Pryor here as a, an a, a attending. She was my PhD uh, thesis advisor at Duke University, where she runs the herbarium there. Um, we've also got the Smithsonian Institution represented by Dr. Larry Skog, um, also a UMD alum. So I just want to throw a little shout out to those of you um, and we'll continue with questions. Wonderful. Um, so another question just came in. How do you know where to find rare specimens? Oh, that's a great question. So um, despite all of that online information that you have available to you, um, we do consider it a priority to protect rare material. And for that reason, the locality data that are associated with rare taxa are usually omitted from the public interface on these websites. Um, and usually it's a matter of working with other botanists who have, are traveling those areas a lot or, or um, know, the, know the region well where you might be looking for a rare specimen. Um, coordinating with uh, members of the Department of Natural Resources or the Forest Service. Um, so a lot of other external partners really assist in that process of finding the rare material. Um, and other times you look for rare things and you look really hard and you don't find them because they're not there anymore. And sadly, that's a reality that we face as botanists all the time. And then knowing that these, some of these specimens are very, very old, do the samples age with time and does that affect the plant characteristics? Sorry, say that once more. Um, so knowing that the samples, do they age with time um, and does the time that passes affect the plant characteristics? Absolutely. Um, and so, uh, for example, we had another question come in uh, relating to this also about, you know, amplifying DNA uh, from herbarium specimens. And the reality is that through time, um, the the 
physical makeup of the specimen, if maintained, really does not change. They will look, I've, I've seen specimens that are hundreds of years old that look like they were collected yesterday. Um, it's, it's, we're getting better at optimizing techniques for maintaining specimens. In the past, some of the older materials aren't as, as nice because we weren't using um, these sort of optimized methods uh, for preservation, for example, keeping them cool, keeping them away from insects and that kind of thing. Um, but when it comes to the molecular side of things, um, just like any other organism, the DNA is still inside of that plant. So even if it's been preserved for some period of time, and DNA will fracture over time, it kind of becomes fragile, just like the specimen itself. Um, but as many of you know, Neanderthal DNA and Mastodon DNA are being sequenced every day. And in fact, we leverage some of these ancient DNA techniques to access um, genetic material from uh, plant specimens as well. And then is the collection limited to the species in northern Minnesota? Absolutely not. Um, our, our collection, we're really beginning to max out our storage in the museum. Um, and so although we do have a lot of, of regional materials, we're looking to expand those. There are a lot of groups for which we don't have very good sampling. Um, but there are also materials whenever researchers do um, expeditions in other countries or in other states. For example, L'Aquila did a lot of work in Southern Florida. Um, those specimens are also deposited here at our um, museum collection. So we have a, a broad representation and a few things even from um, the old world as well. And then a follow-up question in terms of storage. Um, so the cabinets that you mentioned, are they fireproof? Um, and what do you, in terms of protection from theft and fires, um, what does that look like? Oh, that's a great question too. Um, so we keep the, the collection locked unless we're actively in there uh, researching. So physically it's kind of protected in that sense. Um, but destruction by fire is a major concern for all museum collections. Uh, some may be familiar with the loss of the um, National Museum in Rio in Brazil, which was lost to fire within the last handful of years. Um, and you know, so that it's definitely um, something that regardless of whether it's natural history collections or other kinds of cultural um, collections, these, you know, fire is a major issue. Um, so what we use are uh, specimen cabinets that are uh, fire, um, fireproof really, um, but basically they keep water and fire and insects out. So they're specialized cabinets that we use for that purpose. And I'll just mention that um, the National Science Foundation uh, supports in some cases um, uh, the uh, renovation of these older materials. And there was a collection at the University of Vermont that unfortunately suffered fire in one of their historical buildings. And they had made major efforts to um, switch from wooden to metal cabinets. And those that change to the updating of cabinets ultimately saved this incredible resource of specimens that they have at Vermont. So we're really happy to have all of our specimens maintained in metal um, cabinets and we're looking to get more of those as well. Um, we had another question come in wondering about native orchids. Um, if you have a special section for those. Um, and then part two to that question, wondering um, if you ever have any exhibits for parts of the collection. Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, we have incredible orchids here in Minnesota. Um, and that uh, the orchid collection at UMD actually is, it should be more broad than it is. We do have um, even some rare orchids uh, in our collection, but we're really excited with the acquisition of the Algren collection. Um, as we've dug down into that, we found that um, Clifford and Isabel collected a lot of different diversity of orchids um, that are not were not previously represented in our collection. So um, we're really excited to have those materials being incorporated. Um, and uh, the, the exhibit side of things, we're, we're really excited to be kind of honing in on this digitization and um, imaging of the collections. And as that's kind of coming to conclusion, we're starting to focus more on sharing those um, through outreach efforts. So keep your eyes peeled in the next year or so um, for some, uh, maybe some uh, presentations uh, of specimens at the UMD library. And there was actually a fun idea come in um, from Leslie, um, who suggested possibly creating a book um, with some of the artistically arranged um, specimens. So you can put that 
<laughs> no, that's a great idea. Yeah. Something I really would like to start by doing one for the Flora of Glensheen project, um, because back in the Victorian era, it was common for um, people, landowners, to have a physical book of the specimens collected on their property that they would literally have as kind of a coffee book or, or coffee table book in their homes. And so we'd like to kind of recapitulate that with a digital or, you know, with a physical version of the images of specimens that are, are can be highlighted from our collection. So that's definitely in the works. Um, so keep keep your ear to the ground for those um, coming out here uh, in the next year or so. And then actually another question um, that came from Leslie, do you ever get any calling tips from where to find rare specimens? Usually not, um, but they are very much appreciated. Um, again, with rare taxa, we always have to really tread lightly because the, the overarching goal is to maintain those uh, living plants in their localities where they are. And so, especially for rare taxa, um, we encourage uh, folks to not collect specimens unless they've been permitted to do so. Um, but, but it's always helpful to, to notify either the Department of Natural Resources or you can notify us um, if you found something that you think might be rare. Um, if you found something that you think might be rare but you're not sure, we can always help you with the identification process. And how does that identification process work? Does the community member bring in the specimen? Um, how, can you explain a little bit about that? Um, yeah, that pretty much is how it works. Uh, sometimes we'll have people just, you know, bring something by either um, a recently collected plant in a plastic bag. Sometimes we'll have that and, and people have um, ideas about what, you know, what it might be or, or, or looking to know. Um, and hopefully with some of this floor of Glensheen work, we can get a, a nice little um, online uh, uh, place for people to go and compare what they're finding to things that are known from our area. And then this question um, kind of connects with the online archive, um, but in terms of additional information and data saved on the specimens, um, is the online arch archive available to the public? Um, or do you need to pay for a subscription? No, no, it's it's completely free and available. Um, I probably should have thrown a link up there for you guys, but if you just go to Google and search Minnesota Biodiversity Atlas, um, you'll reach the online uh, web page for that. And it's um, we're in the process of imaging and digitizing all of the materials, um, uh, plant materials from Minnesota. But this is um, organized by the Bell Museum down in the Twin Cities. And um, that uh, they are now uh, pushing for efforts beyond plants. So we're starting to look toward even digitizing insect records and other uh, natural history collections across the state. Um, so uh, keep looking there for any, um, uh, any organism that you might be interested in. Um, and I see also someone has asked uh, whether we give any tours of the herbarium. Um, I am absolutely delighted to um, offer tours. Just reach out to me again at that contact information will be at the end of the slide deck um, and or you can just google and, and email me that way um, but we would be very happy to uh, show anyone the collection who's interested and then this is kind of a high level question but wondering how you can relate the work that's happening at the herbarium um, to my life our life as a just a general society and that of others um, how is this applicable well, I think the biggest thing, um, that's a great, great point. Um, the biggest thing is that when we talk about um, the, the health and well being of ecosystems worldwide, the primary producers, the basis of all of these ecosystems and the oxygen producing organisms that we value so much are plants. And so this is a really important um, foothold. It's uh, uh, how we know what plants exist and where. And it's our way of keeping track and maintaining um, uh, uh, some information about plants through time. So I'll just leave, give an example. Um, so in taxonomy, every species that has ever been described is a 
affiliated with a specific physical specimen. It's called a voucher specimen. And along with just voucher specimens collected you know, from our area, the person who originally described a species has designated one specimen to which that name applies. So if you're out in your backyard and you really want to know, is this a new species that I found? And you might be surprised to learn that we do find new things, even in common places, um, is to ultimately go to those voucher specimens and compare them either in their morphology or genetically, which we're increasingly able to do, um, to really identify new and novel diversity. Um, so this is our way of cataloging um, all of the plants that are uh, really contributing to ecosystem wellness. Um, and it's especially important when we're thinking about changing species ranges and phenology um, in the era of climate change. And I'm just, I'm gonna throw out one little thing. I see a question here. Are Native American groups included in the projects, um, perhaps medicinal plants? And I will say um, that uh, museum collections worldwide all hold um, treasures for all of us, but there's also a lot of, um, his history associated with these collections that can be painful for some groups, including um, Native American peoples here in um, northern Minnesota, for example, the Anishinaabe. And it's, a, it's important for us to recognize those tribal lands and peoples and their uses of these plant specimens. And so I'm actually working, um, it's, we're in the process of doing this, but I'm working toward having um, a, a herbarium board that can help oversee some of the decision-making, um, higher order decision making in our, in our uh, collection. And I'm excited about bringing on um, local native partners to um, help balance their priorities as stakeholders in our collection. I'm loving, I'm seeing all these little tidbits of people who have connections and memories of, of um, either Olga Laka or our collection. So it's really, thank you so much for sharing these things. There's lots of, yeah, good memories and stories and a few more questions. I think we have time for a couple more. Um, wondering if you collaborate and work with the College of Biological Science um, at the Twin Cities campus. Very closely, um, yeah, especially at the Bell Museum. So Dr. George Weebland, who's the director at the Bell Museum um, and the conservatory down there, there's also the Como Conservatory as well. Um, but specifically the Bell Museum has been a pivotal partner, um, especially for the digitization and imaging pro process um, where they were the, the head institution for a, a, an LCCMR or ENTRF uh, grant, which leverages Minnesota, um, uh, uh, um, uh, Minnesota, um, Oh, uh, lottery, lottery funding, excuse me, um, lottery funding uh, to support these collections efforts. So um, we have worked really closely with them and continue to do so. Uh, so they've been a, a great resource. Um, and um, Amanda, I know you talked about your research um, with ferns and fern relatives. Um, and I had asked you this one-on-one um, -on -one when we were filming, but do you have a favorite specimen um, and can you just describe that a little bit? <laughs> Okay, um, I do, I, I have many favorite specimens, but one of the things that I love so much about the herbarium and these vouchers is the history that is like deeply intertwined with every one of them. Um, I, my uh, grandfather, uh, maternal grandfather was a, a, a historian by hobby. And so he really impacted that interest for me. Um, and one example is a specimen that we currently have on loan from the Missouri Botanical Garden. Um, it is the type specimen of a desert fern that has been the focus of um, some of my uh, research through the years. And this fern is um, Myriopterus lindheimeri, named after a German immigrant uh, last name Lindheimer. And the specimen was collected in Texas uh, by Lindheimer um, in the 1840s, I think 1846. Um, and you can look at this physical specimen and actually see Lindheimer's original handwriting um, there on the specimen. And it's also really neat when you dig in, um, I found this book called Naturalists of the Frontier. And there was a chapter about Lindheimer and his botanical pursuits um, that overlapped in the time frame um, with the time frame that this specimen was collected. And so I've revisited the type locality um, in Texas and I've uh, leveraged that uh, specimen to uh, 
work with undergraduates and graduate students alike. And it just really, when you're actually looking at the physical material collected by these incredible people through time, um, it just adds this additional level of, um, of meaning that I, I really I can't quite put into words. Very cool. Um, and I think this will be our last question here, but wondering if you can articulate the difference between type and voucher specimen. Great. Um, a type is a kind of voucher specimen. So a voucher specimen is any specimen um, that is accessioned into a collection that has some um, locality data and information associated with it. So these are vouchers. Um, when a person names a new species, they identify a singular voucher specimen to to which that name will apply. Um, so again, it's a voucher, but in, it is designated by a taxonomic expert as the kind of quintessential specimen for a different, a, a new species name. I hope that's helps. <laughs> uh, wonderful. Well, I think we're gonna end it there and thank you so much for taking the time um, to give us this tour. Um, it seems like many of us didn't know that this resource existed and um, it's, it's very interesting and um, a pretty special place here at UMD. Um, I know there was other questions that weren't answered today. Um, if you do would like to follow up with um, Dr. Groose, um, her contact information is on here as well as our office. Um, feel free to reach out directly. Um, we will also include the links to the online archive um, and some other supplemental resources in a follow-up email um, here shortly. So um, you'll have access to all of that. Additionally, if this is your first time joining us for Bulldogs Behind the Scenes, we average about one to two of these virtual sessions a month. Um, if you would like to be added to our uh, event list, please just send us an email at alumni at d.umn.edu. Again, a big thank you to Dr. Groose, and we hope you'll join us again for future online sessions. Thank you. Great to see you all. <laughs>